The following is brought to you by Total Seal Piston Rings, the leader in ring seal technology. TotalSeal.com Hello and welcome to another edition of Hidden Horsepower presented by Total Seal Piston Rings. I'm Joe Costello and we've got another great episode for you. Then again, you subscribed. You know exactly how great they've all been and that's why you have been rating and reviewing either on iTunes, Apple Podcasts, Google Play, SoundCloud, wherever you're listening to the podcast, checking us out on the YouTube channel as well. This week, this episode, he's back, Mr. Lake Speed Jr. Lake, welcome back. How are you? I'm fantastic. Thanks, for Joe, for having me back. I'm really excited about today's guest. I guess as I always am, but this one, buddy near and dear to my heart. I'm just going to tell you right now. Well, and I want to know more about it, but I think people out there are starting to notice the trend that when Lake is the co-host, it's either someone from the NASCAR world, NASCAR legend, or scientist type stuff. So what do we got today? Oh, yeah. Also, obviously people who have been listening know that I love tribology. I'm a member of a group called the Society of Tribologists and Lubrication Engineers. So today we happen to have not only another member of STLE, that's the little abbreviation for the Society of Tribologists and Lubrication Engineers, but also the past president, Dr. Ken Hope, a man that I met when I was working at Joe Gibbs Racing. And there's a really great backstory here uh, on the development of engine oil, because that's, that's a question that we actually get quite often what oil should i be running what I mean what kind of viscosity should i be running it and things like that because obviously you know we're providing piston rings and we're providing piston rings you know from you know formula one cars all the way down to vintage restoration pieces and we've you know, spent a lot of time like we did with dr mark marburg talking about honing and things like that well oil is one of those recipes one of the ingredients if you will in ring seal soup and everyone that knows who's been listening to this they already know I love me some ring seal soup. So today we're going to do a deep dive on one of those key ingredients in ring seal soup, the base oil. Before you put additives in it, before it's a finished product, you begin with base oil. So there's no one better to talk about base oil than Dr. Ken Hope from Chevron Phillips because they are a world-class base oil provider. Excellent. Thank you very much, Lake. Uh Wow, that's uh, quite an introduction, and uh, it's just my pleasure to to be on this podcast with uh, with you and Joe today. I've enjoyed listening to a couple of podcasts before, and and so uh, always been very very interesting. So yes, uh, uh, base oil, PAO, these things are some of my favorite subjects. So it's just my absolute pleasure to be able to talk with you guys today. How we could steal a few minutes of your time today, right? This is great, isn't it, Joe? Yeah, well, exactly. And, uh, you know, you're the president of the STLE or were the president of the STLE. And so you probably have a good uh, good story or two about Lake. And so you can share that with us a little bit later on in the show. <laughs> okay, happy to do that. <laughs> exactly. I can, I, can tell you, <laughs> I can tell you now that Lake is one of the most energetic uh, tribologists that I've ever known. So uh, it's always just a, a joy to be around. So, And um, he's a very humble guy, but this guy knows quite a lot. So let me just kind of pump him <laughs> up a little bit there. I, I think it's uh, great that he has this opportunity to, uh, to talk on this podcast. Well, and the blurring of... Well, I, learned, I learned it all from him, by the way, Joe. Well, and, so you know, I learned it all from Ken. So. Well, and that's why people are listening, because they want to learn from both of you, right? And we talk to engine builders and guys who want to go fast or make a little more money in their shop. But at the end, uh, this soup that we're going to talk about, like Lake talks about ring seal soup on a pretty regular basis, the whole combination of the many elements that provide for sealing a cylinder you're, now we're talking about a different soup, right, Lake? We're talking about the, the oil and, in particular, the base oil. So why don't you start us off where we need to start to fully understand this? Yeah, right. It's kind of the soup within the soup, or maybe it's the broth, right? Maybe the, our engine oil is more of the broth within the soup. So as we were kind of alluding to already, you know, uh, a bottle of motor oil. You have base oil, you have additives. And when we talk about additives, we're talking about things like ZDDP, zinc, what a lot of people call it. 
uh, and I were added as well. But there's a whole lot more. Like in just one of the oils we were doing at Gibbs for the recent team, we have 14 different additives in it completely. So very complex chemistry in order to achieve the performance we were, we were after. But before you begin additives, you really need to begin is with the base oil. And that's really the where I met um, Ken was at one of the SCLE conferences. So in 2010, you had the beginning of the two-car draft, where it basically is tandem drafting because the, the bumpers of the cars were the same height. So you could push, you know, literally one car could push the other car. And you were able to go faster that way because now you were not just drafting, you're literally pushing the other car. So you could really gain speed. And what happened was you could only push for so long. And then the, the car pushing began to overheat. And so we spent a little bit of time thinking about, okay, well, how can we – the number of times you change because every time you have to change positions and you know the front car go to the back and the back car go to the front in order to cool back off you lost speed not only were you vulnerable to being passed but you also broke that inertia so that was the goal reduce the number of times you had to change so you wanted to go further before you switched well the first school of thought on how to do that was well we need to put bigger radiators in and higher temperature radio caps and all those kind of things. Of course, everybody did that. And of course, the NASCAR stepped in and put a rule that uh, this is the size of the radio you have. And this is the maximum you can put on the cap. Okay. So now the engine's basically going to go as hot as the water will allow it. And then that's the, the top off point. Well, what many people didn't think about was the oil itself in terms of it being a coolant, right? So I'm going to let Ken talk about that here in a minute, but I want to finish setting up the story and then let uh, Dr. Hope kind of begin to tell you about this chemistry and the science behind the base oil and what made this such a cool thing. I'm actually looking at the picture <laughs> of the two-car draft on my shelf right now because this was an incredible moment uh, to me uh, in this whole process. So we began to look at the oil as an additional coolant. A lot of guys began to think, okay, well, the engine's going to run hotter. Oil gets thinner as it gets hotter, so we need to go up in viscosity. So just to kind of give you an idea, most of these restrictor plate engines have been running what we would consider a zero W20. But I want to go beyond the SAE grades and get a little more specific and use a term called cinestoke. So that's the actual flow measurement of the oil. And we do that at 100 degrees Celsius, which is 212 degrees Fahrenheit. So we were running much hotter than that, but don't worry about that for now. We just worry about the number. So we were running an oil that was essentially 8.7 cinestokes. Many other teams went higher in viscosity. They went to like 12.5 cinestokes. I know of one team that went all the way to 16.7 they went from a 0 20 to a 15 w50 we went down in viscosity so uh dr hope why don't you tell them the method to our madness why would we be so crazy when we're trying to cool something why do we go thinner on oil and not hotter or not heavier so that's a that's a great setup like because there's a lot of different things that are going on at the same time. The main thing is the viscosity. And we've heard over and over again that the most important parameter for a lubricating oil is viscosity. So it's that measure of the fluid's resistance to flow. Some people, you know, talk about viscosities being thicker or thinner, but uh, it, it really comes down to uh, the fluid's resistance to flow. Now, that resistance to flow will be different at different temperatures. And it's, it's not a straight you know, line that you can easily plot. It, it's actually more of a semi-logarithmic, and it, it's kind of a difficult thing to plot. But mm -hmm. um, you had mentioned, uh, I believe, viscosity index, and that's um, kind of a one number, uh, uh, an indication of 
the performance of that viscosity temperature curve. So, uh, how quickly it loses got, its viscosity, essentially. The higher the yeah, number yeah. of the viscosity index, the less quickly it loses viscosity with temperature. Right. So a higher VI is always better because uh, at higher temperatures, a higher VI uh, oil will not lose its viscosity as the temperature increases. And so that's good because it gives you good protection between the moving surfaces. And then at lower temperature, a higher VI is also good because it means the oil is not going to become thicker or be more viscous at the lower temperatures. Um, so it can get, you know, to those nooks and crannies, it can still provide uh, good lubrication. And it, in both cases, a higher VI is always better. So with a higher VI oil, it enables you to drop from that 12 and a half centistoke down to the 8.7 centistoke that you mentioned without losing protection. And it enables you to uh, not have as much viscous drag because as, as the oil becomes thicker, as the viscosity, as the temperature decreases, then uh, that's an energy, you know, uh, sap. It's going to steal and rob energy away from the engine or away from uh, where, you know, whatever system needs to be doing work. So uh, Exactly. I, I can yeah. say for a fact, just to give people who are listening a concrete example, on the engine dyno, uh, Joe, out there at Ron Shaver's place, when we take an engine and run that same engine and run it on a 20W50 at a fixed engine speed with a given with a fixed load on the engine that 2050 will run about 40 degrees hotter on oil temperature than a zero w30 will everything else is the same same water temperature going in the engine same amount of oil same engine speed same load it can be that dramatic a difference in engine oil temperature which is essentially cooling the engine, just going from a 2050 down to a zero W30. So, Dr. Hope, you can continue on. Yes. So the viscosity is the first uh, and the most important uh, thing that we're dealing with there. But there's two other things that are going on also. One, of course, is friction, and friction is going to generate heat, uh, and that heat has to be removed. And so you mentioned oil as a coolant, looking at that oil as a coolant, and that's another important factor because that's what I've been saying for, for many years. Really, the second function of the oil is to remove the heat. First function is to reduce the friction. Second function is to remove that heat. And when you look at different types of base oils, uh, the PAO actually has a higher specific heat. And that means it has a, a higher ability to absorb heat. And, of course, that's the first step of removing heat is, is absorbing that heat. And then the oil can transmit that heat uh, to some other place to, uh, from where, uh, where you're away from where that heat is being generated by the friction. So those things, the viscosity, the uh, friction, lower coefficient friction is always better, and then the higher specific heat. And I think that specific heat um, really gets into that two two car draft scenario because if you can more effectively cool the uh, cool the engine quicker, or if you're not generating as much heat, then you're going to be doing less of that um, you know that car dumping out where it's getting a lot more heat, uh, a lot more uh, wind and uh, flow onto the engine and, and cooling the engine but also you know fighting against the wind uh, so i think all those things are acting together right so what we did and we can talk more a little bit more uh later about the metallocene uh pao which is one of the base oils uh that chevron phillips manufacturers that we were the to give you guys some specific numbers so I mentioned the oil we've been using previously to the 2011 season was 8.7 centistokes. That was the flow measurement at 100 degrees Celsius. That engine oil also had a viscosity index of 172. 
for the 2011 season, we tuned the viscosity down to 7.2 centistokes. So we went even thinner than we had been before. And we raised the viscosity index to 207. So that was a huge changeover. And then the results of that change were that we went down to Daytona and in the very first practice they had, we ran seven laps straight with Joey Logano pushing Kyle Busch. And they went, I think, 209 miles an hour in practice because of that. Like, no one else could go more than, like, three laps before they changed. And we went seven laps. And we and then finally changed and went 209 miles an hour. And, of course, what did NASCAR do? They changed the rules on some stuff at the end of that practice because we were going way too fast. But the bottom line is we went down there and won the um, Bud Shootout or whatever they call that race, um, you know, the, the all-star type race before the season. That was the first race of the year, first race with this package. And we went out and won that race easily Denny, with Denny Hamlin and then actually won our, our dual races and then we got caught up in an accident in the 500 itself. But we re- had dominated the 500 that year then actually won several other plate races throughout the year. So that was just a testament to taking this concept of, you know, the, the science, if you will, of tribology and, and looking, like Dr. Hope said, of looking at the viscosity itself, looking at the coefficient of friction of the base oils, and then looking at the specific heat of those base oils, and then looking at the viscosity index of those base oils, and coming up with a base oil blend prior to putting any additives in it that was superior to anything else we had ever ran, and it really enabled a whole other level of engine performance by doing that. So, I mean, that, that's kind of to, to wrap it up and say, okay, here's what, ha- here's what we did. Here are the results. And we came up with this crazy formulation using this brand new base oil technology that they had just come out with. And then we were able to go win races with it right off the go. And it was just, it's one of my favorite memories, actually, of, of all the stuff I've done in, in my professional life. It was so cool. And, you know, Joe, it reminds me of when we had Larry Wallace you know, on the show talking about NASCAR. It's like, you want to get your name by the rules they put in the rule book, right? So I guess, I guess that might be mine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the, the tandem draft, it was, a, it was a moment in time that everybody recalls. And, uh, you know, whether they liked it or they didn't like it, it was a big part of it. And you guys went to work on it. And you found a solution. And next thing you know, you're going 209 miles an hour. And the guy's in the, nah, we can't have that. Sorry. And pulled the plug. You did too well. You should have right. kept it a secret, Lake. Well, we couldn't. They were, they were too fast, right? I think they were trying to find a limit. I think it was that was the deal. Is those guys went out and practiced. It's like, okay, we've been working on this all year. And you know, please understand, it wasn't miss me. There was, you know, there's 500 plus people at Joe Gibbs Racing back then. There's an army of engineers, and everyone on that team, top to bottom, did a phenomenal job of building cars that were just simply more efficient in every aspect possible. And then we had a couple of drivers that were, you know, going to go out there and find the limits. How, how far can we push this package? What is it capable of doing? And they went out there in their first practice, and they, you know, found the limits of what it could do. And NASCAR deemed that too far beyond their limits. <laughs> so they, they responded, you know. But So what, what I'd like to do now is we've kind of talked all around it. But we haven't talked about it yet. The, the key thing – in that formula was this metallocene PAO base oil. So if you will, uh, Dr. Hope, explain to the listeners, you know, what is a metallocene PAO and how is that different from what most people would know about an oil? Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, PAOs have actually been around for a long time. I'm not going to go into history, but uh, uh, we've, for Chevron, Chevron Phillips, we've been making PAO since uh, December of 1980 and a continuous uh, large-scale uh, production. 
So um, and most people would know that as synthetic oil, right? Man, that's, if, that's if you're looking yeah, at that's, okay. That's correct. It's a it's a synthetic oil. It's a, if you're you know anything about API, then API has different uh, groups for motor oils for I mean for base oils, and then uh, there's group one, two, and three, which are the mineral oils, and group four is PAO. It has its own group all to itself, and then group five is kind of a catch-all. So. Uh, we've been making these for quite a long time, and they've had a lot of use in in, um, in transportation, industrial applications, military applications. There's a lot of you know, wide, even cosmetics and such. So it's it's really interesting. But um, the MPAO is referring to the type of catalyst that we used, uh, that we employed to uh, to make these uh, these higher viscosity base oils. And uh, uh, metallocene is kind of a, um, a category of different catalysts, and it, it refers to like a single site catalyst. And from a chemist standpoint, that's a little interesting because you know exactly kind of what, what the catalyst active site looks like, and, and you can theorize what's going on, how the molecules are knitted together. And this, this molecule is knitted together in a very regular fashion, uh, which uh, may not seem like it's a good thing, but it actually is a good thing because um, for for oils, for PAOs, you want a lot of diversity in chemical structure. And these fluids are, are liquid down to very, very low temperatures. Um, and that's one of the reasons why they're used so readily in, in some of these uh, very extreme type of applications. You can you can go down to the very cold temperature extremes, and they'll still flow. And before we invented this um, uh, this kind of molecule, there really wasn't a high viscosity oil that was still uh, low enough viscosity at low temperature, and even has a very very low pour point. Uh, that type of material just simply didn't exist. So um, it, it lends itself to a lot of very interesting applications where you have to have a higher viscous material for one reason or another at, uh, and, and still need to have good flow properties at, at low temperatures as well. So, um, so that's kind of MPAO in a nutshell. It has a very good pour point that, uh, that measures that flowability at low temperatures, has a very high viscosity index. Um, and uh, it's a it's a different type of structure. So, yeah, when when this application came out and you started talking about uh, what's going on in, in NASCAR and racing, we were all very excited to see because it was a very uh, interesting application for us. I think a lot of people have a uh, very good interest in, in NASCAR, of course, and, and racing, and generally things that go. A lot of people would kind of, characterize themselves as gearheads i kind of call myself a gearhead but uh um yeah it's there's interesting things that uh, that do go so well that's yeah, great because i think one of the things that you're kind of mentioning there the mineral base oils that's where they typically have a lower viscosity index they typically have a lower specific heat value mm -hmm. so even for the same viscosity blend, a mineral-based product or even a semi-synthetic a blend will not have the same viscosity index, base oil alone, as the PAO. It won't have the same specific heat as the PAO. And then one of the other factors that we didn't realize in the front end that actually ended up being real beneficial on the back end was the air release properties of mm -hmm. the MPAO were way better than the the regular PAOs, or the yeah, high viscosity PAO at least. That's a that's a good point, and that was kind of a happy accident. Um, we didn't really design that into the molecule. Uh, these these molecules are carefully designed, but uh, having air release from the oil is very important. And I'll just kind of tell people why that's important. And 
it comes down to the fact that air is not a very good lubricant. Uh, foam, uh, which is a mixture of you know air bubbles and, and the oil, uh, doesn't really support a load very well because it's mostly air. And uh, the other thing is that foam is very difficult to pump. So you want to circulate, you want to have, have the ability to circulate an oil uh, to keep everything lubricated. But if it's, if it's foamy, then, then you're not going to be able to pump that and uh, you're going to have problems. Uh, then another factor is in the foaming is that air release. There's like foam on one hand and then air release, which seems similar, but it's really not. Air release is how quickly that air is going to come out of that oil. And, uh, you know, so that could impact the compressibility of the, uh, of the lubricant. And uh, oftentimes, you, you know, you want to have good hydraulics so you have things respond quickly. And if there's any residual air left over in that, in that lubricant, then uh, it's going to feel kind of, um, uh, it's not going to respond well. It's going to feel kind of Be spongy. Or yeah. Spongy. Yes. Good word. Well, and the thing about this, Joe, uh, and, and the listeners who are building racing engines, especially engines um, that have vacuum pumps you know, or dry sump pumps that pull crankcase vacuum, when you're doing that, you're putting more air into that oil tank than you are oil in a lot of cases. You know, you, you know, it's not uncommon in, you know, like Hartford's Pro Stock car to be pulling, you know, well over 20 inches of crankcase vacuum. So there's a lot of air riding with the oil going back into the oil tank. And that air release property is critical because it's not going to be a whole lot longer before that oil goes back into the engine and like Dr. Hope was saying, you don't want an aerated oil because it can't carry the load as well. And if you're running an engine, say like a factory shootout car or something like that, that may have some hydraulic lifters or something in there, you want those things to be moving that valve, not being squishy. So there's a lot of performance advantage here to this. And, you know, you, somebody may be listening and say, all right, well, all right, you guys are total steel. You sponsor the show. What, what does this have any, any to do with piston rings? Well, it's got a ton to do with piston rings back to this specific heat. You want that oil to be cooling the piston so you can run a thinner piston ring. If you're only relying on the, the radial thickness and the axial thickness of that piston ring to get the heat out of the piston, then you're, you're missing the boat in terms of efficiency. You could be using your oil in order to pull more heat out of that piston, which will allow you to run thinner rings for less drag and more engine efficiency. So it's back to that soup, Joe. You know, you knew I was going to go there, right? You, you love knew the, the soup. The ring seal soup was coming back. Right? They all love the <laughs> soup, Lake. They love it. Doctor Hope, you know. they love ring seal soup. I love soup in general. So ring field soup, uh, ring seal soup sounds interesting <laughs> okay it's not tasty i can tell you that i mean uh, italian <laughs> wedding soup definitely tastes better than ring seal soup you know but it's still functional it can, it can still get the job done and be something you know pretty efficient so you know hopefully we didn't nerd out too much with all that you know but i i, I know from talking to our customers and talking to some of the listeners uh of hidden horsepower this is the kind of information they want they can because it's something that can help them change how they think so that the next time you know they have an engine that's running hot the first option may not be just go grab a bigger radiator well the right option might be i need to put thinner piston rings in i need to change my oil and go to a lower viscosity oil and that may have to change my bearing clearance a little bit for that so jack cornett one of our previous guests that had been on one of the pri show episodes with us he came to me, it was probably about two years after I met Dr. Hope, he came to me with a similar problem. The, the dirt late models, they were running really hot, and you know they were running a 1550 already, and he was saying, man, do we need to go to like a 2060 or something? Do we need to make this thing heavier in terms of viscosity because these engines are running so hot? 
I said, Jack, we need to go to a 10W40. We need to go the opposite direction. And he trusted in us. And the same thing, we used an oil with that metallocene catalyst PAO. And we had that same kind of chemistry idea that we applied at Joe Gibbs Racing. We applied that to his dirt late model engine, and he saw the same thing. The engine temperatures came down just by changing the oil type and viscosity, you know, and over time, you know, Jack's been able to keep these engines more efficient because he's gone thinner and thinner on the piston rings. He doesn't use the 16th, 16th, 316th piston rings anymore. He's using one millimeter or smaller rings in his stuff, and those engines are living longer because it's that whole package that he's put together of the ring, the hone, the oil, and again, back to it, it's ring seal soup. We're, we're putting that package together that enables greater performance and durability. You're not having to pick one or the other. Okay, I did never thought on that on 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 the uh, the, the piston rings and and such because I'm kind of out of my element on that one. But uh, um, well, I, I would assume uh, that you guys at Chevron Phillips work with a, a wide range of customer groups be it some are oems on the automotive side but they're probably also some industrial companies and things like that and i know that these base oils aren't being used just in engines they're also being used in gearboxes and, and hydraulic systems you know, what are some of the things that you see outside of the automotive realm with these products yeah so the emphasis um, of late, and I say of late, but it really started quite some time ago, almost 20 years ago. We had some of the first uh, interactions with uh, uh, with Volkswagen because they had observed in a, a rear axle test a uh, redu- reduction in the operating temperature. So, and it gets back to the specific heat. They were looking at it versus some of the other mineral oils and, and such. Um, and now that has come up again because people are looking for thinner and thinner oils as you're looking toward electric vehicles, dare I say, on such a podcast. <laughs> but um, Just fine. Hey, everybody likes to race. You can, people race Teslas. Yeah. Joe's seen some Teslas there race at Miami. Absolutely. Right down there. Very fast, by the yeah, way. Those, they can be very exciting. But uh, for those applications n- – now you not only have to have all the viscosity properties um, and the volatility properties and and all the specific heat and friction and all those other things, but now it's got to be thinner and it's got to be a dielectric, it means that it, it cannot be conductive. Uh, so, you know, most oils are non-conductive, but it especially has to have some very tight conductivity uh uh, limitations so it can be termed as a dielectric medium um, because now it's coming in contact with say hybrid uh, transmissions where you have a couple wetted motors inside the transmission housing so which seems so they're using the oil as a coolant in that, in that exactly. case. they're using the oil to exactly. cool the motor yeah and uh, so there you've got a couple things fighting each other because you want low temperature, but then uh, you also need to have a certain amount of viscosity for protection. Um, but then you can't have too high a viscosity uh, because, you know, you have to have some transmission efficiency. And so there's many, many competing things going on there. And, uh it, it leads to very interesting scenarios. So, yeah, that's uh, kind of what's what's going on there. Now, uh, there are other applications also that get into some of the Bitcoin mining and computer cooling, because now you have computers doing uh, some of the things that, uh, you know, they're running the Internet, running our, our controlling our cell phones and, and communications, and as well as the the normal types of uh, things that computers do. Um, but so what role does for those... base oil have yeah. with that? Well, you're using the base oil now to cool the computer, and you're, I think I've just blown your mind. If you didn't know about this, <laughs> you're, 
you're looking at applications where people are taking these computers that used to be in a rack server system room uh, cooled with air conditioner just blasting and now you reach the limitations of what the air conditioning can do and you're trying to go faster and faster with the computers which generates more and more heat and the way we get rid of the heat is immerse the computer in a vat of oil <laughs> now see that's that's the mind blowing part this is happening this is amazing but uh it's it's the wave of the future so um it's and and I've got a dog that's settling down here but uh anyway but yeah it's the it's the wave of the future uh, people are just pushing so fast with computation capabilities and and so everything that we've learned in the trans- transportation sector for making things go is now being used to make computers go, being used to calculate cryptocurrency calculations for for blockchain and, and whatever the heck that is. But, um, huh. yeah, so new applications come up all the time. And it's uh, it's never been a, a dull moment, really, <laughs> in my world here. You're not kidding. How about that, Joe, from engine blocks to blockchain in one episode? Yeah, I think that's going to be like our little pocket title for this one. Pretty amazing. But we always knew it, though, Dr. Hope, that we, those of us who are entertained by race cars, who want to be around race cars, that there was some sort of higher purpose other than our own self-gratification. And now, oh. thanks to you, we know we were saving the world through our racing, right? We <laughs> were we're doing great things. That's absolutely the case. Yeah, because um, the racetrack is, that's your laboratory. You can do so many experiments uh, there, and that's all the cutting edge. Uh, I, I don't know, people on Saturday and Sunday, when they, when they tune in to to watch racing if they recognize that they're watching the cutting edge science that's going on that could impact not only the cars on the road tomorrow but even beyond that in technologies being developed in the laboratories in the actual chemical laboratories that are going on today exactly maybe if you watch the formula one race on sunday those engines are over 50 percent thermal efficiency a a really really good production engine like the high-end production engines 30 to 35 percent so this these engines are nearly 50 percent more thermal efficient than the best production engines so it's incredible to see what racing technology can do and like you said joe it's tongue-in-cheek but they're answer is actually real is that racing technology can be something that can save the world it can help us address the challenges that we face as a world and i think racers when we partner with science you know people like dr hope and dr cantor have been on the show before dr malberg when we really work together as a collective i, I you know, it's, it's it sounds cliche but there is literally nothing we can't do that's amazing. That and that's yeah, the whole point. Exciting. It's so exciting. But like figuring out the right application and the right time and and what to do with it. That's uh that's where we are. It's like a it's the it's what is it? It's the end of the beginning and not the anyway, you get my point. We've got to a part <laughs> where we're now going about to start uh, all of these processes to see what's uh, uh, able to be accomplished. Well, you know, I was thinking about the uh, electric vehicle conference that uh, I saw Dr. Hope at last fall. And when they were going through some of the challenges from, you know, a plug-in hybrid to um, a full EV and some, you know, hydrogen we've talked about about before could be in the mix here too. Um, When you look at the gearboxes and, you know, electric motor speeds of, you know, 16, 20,000 RPM plus, well, all of a sudden those gearboxes and what that fluid needs to do and what it behaves like, it starts to sound like 
some of the racing fluids we've already done. It's like, I think we could get pretty close to what those things need from stuff we've already done, all, you know, in the past, because mm-hmm. it, the challenges are pretty similar. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so, Lake, um, just a quick quiz. <laughs> Don't want to put you on the spot, but what's the thermal efficiency of a typical electric vehicle? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I, I think we might. Uh, what you had mentioned with the uh, with the Formula One being fifty, going over fifty percent thermal efficiency. I think you're probably approaching that uh, of, a, of an electric vehicle if if you're not there already. So, it's kind of an interesting thing to look at. But um, and I know there are some electrical components that are on those uh, uh, those Formula One. They are. They're hybrids. So it, it's mm-hmm. not a straight internal combustion engine. It's a very complex hybrid engine where they're using um, turbocharging to help boost the efficiency of the engine, but they're using electric motors to recover energy from the exhaust and then feed it back independently of engine speed to the intake. So they can run the engine at optimal boost levels regardless of engine speed which is something a traditional supercharger or turbocharger just can't do and that was the real innovation um out of that and the credit of the guys at mercedes benz amg because they're the ones that really did it first and of course they uh, got the spoils of that with several world championships um but there is a lot of energy recovery on the car and i think that when you look at that technology and you say all right well if internal combustion engine can can do this and we think about that the stle conference back in may the gentleman from nissan were they were saying hey internal combustion engines have to evolve and become more efficient because they don't know what the future is going to be they don't know if it's going to be hydrogen fuel cell or battery electric only or some mixture of hybrid and we know cummins they're working on hydrogen combustion so we don't know what the future is going to be but we do know we have to become more efficient, period. And I think that's where this whole episode kind of plays into that is that we have to look at the base oils and embrace these technologies and to think about these things holistically and understand that there's efficiency to be gained. Mm-hmm. I, I think uh, kind of what you're saying is we all need to be driving around on Formula One vehicles. I agree with that. Let's do it. I'm with you. Sign on. (laughs) Everybody in the audience, we just got 10,000 emails. They all agree. All (laughs) Formula One style vehicles for every commuter. (laughs) Got my vote. Well, I think that's one of the reasons people watch uh, motor racing in general. And I know there's been a push pull amongst the rules makers because if it's so much science fiction, it's very expensive um, and, and then no one can do it. Uh, and they want close competition, and so they keep like the rule. You guys figured something out, and they put the they they put the kibosh on it immediately. Like, oh, look at them! They figured something out. Great job! Take it away. Uh, but at the same time, there's a group of motorsports fans, and and many of them are Formula One fans that really like to watch technology get pushed out there for all of these yeah. reasons. And so there is a there is a balance. And I, you know, the technology race fan, I know at the NHRA, there are people who are always asking us, not that, you know, we do have modern technology that are involved in something that is very restricted by the rules, but people always want to know how it works, what's in there, what kind of metal, what kind of, uh, you know, unobtainium is used. And so this is a very worthwhile conversation. Well, I think this is what motorsports does best, is that we're really good problem solvers, and when you give us the incentive, which is winning, <laughs> then we will more than likely come up with an answer. <laughs> you know, And the more racers you get involved, probably the better answer you're going to come up with in the end because people learn. They see what someone did, then they build off of it, and they get better. You know, Like I said, you know, Mercedes came up with the idea of the split turbo years ago, and they had an advantage for a while. But then you see that, obviously – Red Bull and Ferrari have made great strides, and they've learned from what Mercedes did, and then they came up with their own iterations of it, and everything just keeps getting better and better. 
uh, because you're just that quest for efficiency. And I think that that's to make to me that's where racing is at its best. That's where we're the most beneficial to the world. And I think sometimes people look at racing as these crazy guys burning up fuel and and all this kind of stuff. And I don't think that's the right read. I think if you look at racers as competitors that are innovative people, they're creating new solutions. Then it's the right way of looking at it. Which you go back and you think, you know, Ford versus Ferrari and some of those that that movie and that whole genre uh, of motorsport is because the OEMs knew the racers were the guys that were going to blaze the path forward. That's how they were going to make their products better is by sending their engineers and having them go to Le Mans, have them go to Daytona or in Indianapolis or, or wherever and learn from these racers and get that mindset that it's, it's a way of, like Ken said, it's a way of proving things out so much faster than you normally can in a lab. It's a good point. It's a good point. Dr. Hope, at the end of each episode, we ask for advice for the next generation, for engine builders, etc. Um, but I am going to allow you to take us in whatever direction you want with a final thought or two in that you know the audience, uh, you know, Lake and beyond. Uh, the fact that you are um, knowledgeable and able to understand things at that uh, most basic of level and then talk about it in a way that, you know, like – Racing to computing, for instance. Mm-hmm. Um, feel free to take this moment as a final thought. I'm sure Lake is going to have a final question or two for you as well. But uh, you know, given all we've spoken about here on the show, uh, you know, what do you think our audience can most benefit from information-wise? Okay, so it's an interesting question. You know, looking at the advice for uh, the next generation, we see a lot of things that are going on. In, uh, in transportation today, there's a lot of uncertainty. We, uh, we, we like uh, having things the way that we have them today. And it's uh, that, that, you know, embracing that kind of change is, can be difficult and, uh, and challenging, but can also be exciting when it leads to, uh, to new technologies. You mentioned some of the uh, uh, acceleration of some of these electric vehicles and and such which is just uh mind-blowing but i will caution people uh with this saying that it, the industry doesn't really turn on a dime it's it's not so much like a speedboat it's much more like a battleship and it does take uh, a lot of time and preparation because we as we learn from covid we're all very interconnected our supply chains are all um you know, they have long arms that reach into various different segments that we may not have understood uh, uh, prior to this. So um, that being said, you know, things are going to change, and I think it's going to be for the better, but we're also going to find that uh, we're going to need some of the technologies that we have developed to where we are, to the point where we are today. Um, for many years to come. So uh, I think a lot of the things that um, are here today are going to be around tomorrow, but tomorrow is going to exist with some of these additional technologies, and it's going to be a good thing. So that's what I have to say about that. Lake, final question for Dr. Ken Hope. Well, Dr. Hope, one thing I I appreciate so much that your service to the uh, tribology community by being, uh, you know, volunteering as the past president of STLE. And I would encourage everyone that listens to go to STLE.org, go to the website and try to, you know, start learning a little bit about this stuff. Cause I, I, I want to get your take on it, but mm-hmm. I feel like this was the, a field that I wish I had known about this when I was younger. I mean, I, I've certainly enjoyed my time in it and look forward to many more years of being involved in tribology. But, man, I wish someone had told me that this existed years before I found it. It would have been so much more exciting. So maybe the, the message to the younger crowd is, you know, what would your advice be to them on how to get involved in the science of tribology? Mm-hmm. That's a great question. And 
so STLE does have a lot of information that's available, you know, to the members, but it also has a lot of information that's uh, available just to the general public. And tribology touches so many different, uh, so many different facets of our lives. And uh, one of the other previous presidents, uh, Mike Anderson with Phalex, uh, said, you know, that tribology is everywhere, and it really is. Uh, it's one of my first columns that I, I wrote in uh, the Tribology and Lubrication Technology magazine, and, and one of your duties as president is to write uh, kind of a column at the beginning of that magazine. And one of the first ones I wrote was on the Tribology of Bowling. It was my Thursday night Tribology experiment because you had a bowling ball at a certain mass. You were throwing it at a certain speed. There's oil coating the lane. And as it, it goes down the lane, the friction changes, especially in the last five or six feet. Uh, and it can grab the lane when it's spinning and uh, accelerate into the pin. So there's a lot of things that go on with uh, and what we've been talking about with, with gears and, uh, and engines and, and things like that that goes on on that bowling alley. But um, uh, the way to find out and to learn more about tribology and lubrication uh, science is uh, through the SCLE. And so you can go to their website at uh, www.scle.org and um, uh, you can learn a lot of information there that uh, it is kind of at your own pace. And you can sign up and, and download webinars or, or read different articles. You can search for different uh, uh, articles and, and their overall body of knowledge there. So, yeah, as people come into a new field, then they uh, uh, are, or should be looking for ways to learn everything that they can so that they can become an expert, so that can, they can become very knowledgeable and be able to put all the pieces together uh, so that they can further that science, further that field, go a little bit further down the road uh, and, and make a good, honest uh, contribution to, uh, to society in general. So it's good for all of us. Wow. Exactly. That, no, absolutely. That, that is, uh, and, and I think we all feel that way one way or another. And we love when a technology kind of goes from racing into other things that we can we can claim it. Lake, this one has been amazing. Dr. Ken Hope, really appreciate you coming on this show. This has been tremendous because it just it kind of puts scale to the whole thing, right, Lake? Like we're we're involved in racing, but there's just so much more going on here. Well, it's the unintended consequences. The, the, I must say call that the butterfly effect that what we're doing in racing is trickling out because we do something here and they take one aspect of that and it can go somewhere else and then it goes somewhere else and it goes somewhere else. It's neat to see that what we do can have a greater influence and understand that things happening other places also can influence us and that we are interconnected. I think that's a great story to be told. Great episode. Dr. Hope, thank you so much for joining us here on Hidden Horsepower. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity. And there he goes, Dr. Ken Hope Lake. That one, what are you trying to do to us, Lake? Like, man, we're getting smarter over here. How many of these uh, Lake Speed (laughs) Scientist episodes, I find myself, like, deeply thinking about what he's saying, and I I love race cars. It's The two worlds are colliding, Lake. I'm trying to educate all you people. You're You're catching on to my my master plan, Joe. I figured it out, everybody. (laughs) This guy, no, like, well, really interesting to hear about how the world of the racing industry is inspiring and kind of teaching the ways to all these other industries. And uh, but it also makes sense. That's something we knew already. Right. That racers do it better when we're like forced uh, evolution is really what it is. Oh, that's a great analogy. And I think so. And that's why it's great. That we have people like Dr. Ken Hope and Dr. Neil Cantor and Dr. Mark Berg, people like that, that are willing to come put their time and energy into us crazy racing people because they see that they get something back out of it too. And then we all benefit from, from their help and involvement. Exactly. 
Simple as that. Just like people who want their engine built out there can can benefit from the involvement of the folks at Total Seal Piston Rings. And uh, let's talk a little bit about that, what's going on over at Total Seal. And for the people out there who are working on their projects, the year, we're about halfway through the year, won't be long till they're planning their refresh during the off season and the winter break. Uh, what should they do? What do you got for them? What's going on over there? Well, a couple of things. Uh, one, we're working on some new coating technology. We won't let the cat out of the bag yet, but we've had some tests recently that were really encouraging, and we're going to be doing some more testing throughout the summer and into the fall. So hopefully by PRI in December, we'll be able to have a, an announcement about maybe some really life-changing, you know, world-shattering new coating technology for piston rings. But in the meantime, if you just need to freshen up your stuff, give us a call, 623-587-7400. We have a ton of product on the shelf. We've been getting in more raw material in the last couple of months, and the production guys have been killing it, cranking out product, rebuilding inventory. So back to the supply chains that we talked about, we're in pretty good shape. We're not where we want to be yet, but we're getting closer and closer day by day. And all the guys there in Arizona are doing a killer job you know, getting orders in, getting stuff processed, and getting stuff shipped out. And so, yeah, it's it's a great time to be at Total Seal. That is excellent stuff. So if they need uh, something from Lake Speed, where do they get a hold of you? Uh, lake at TotalSeal.com is my email. Send me an email. Uh, if you got a question about anything, you know, piston rings or whatever, shoot to me. I'll, I'll get back to you. And I love the fact that uh, Dr. Ken Hope was as into it as we were into what he had to say as well. If you're into it, folks— Subscribe, click the bell on YouTube, subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, SoundCloud, wherever you get your podcasts, of course, all the Total Seal social media. But also rate and review the podcast. That makes a big deal, and we've got to ask you. Rate and review the podcast. Five stars if you like what you're hearing. I certainly hope you do. Lake, final thought for everybody. Well, again, Joe, I can't thank all of our listeners enough. We look at the numbers. We get the feedback. You you see it at the racetrack. I see it as I travel around. We get the emails. Thank you to our listeners for making this successful. And keep on pushing us. Keep giving us ideas of topics you want to hear from or hear about and people you want to hear from. Agreed. He's Lake Speed. I'm Joe Costello. And we'll be back with another episode of Hidden Horsepower presented by Total Seal very, very soon. Have a great day, everybody. Thank you so much.